Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. God bless you. Uh, thank you for joining us on the program today. Uh, I trust you've been following us and uh, what we've been sharing from the book of Revelation. Not going to take a lot of time to uh, go back over some of those things, but I will tell you quickly that if you've missed any of the former programs, go back to YouTube. Uh, we have archived everything we've aired to date there so that you can go back and study them, get notes from it. Uh, uh, all of that is very possible for you to do. Also, we have an iTunes uh, podcast that podcasts the audio version of this. Uh, if you sign up for our iTunes uh, podcast, it will be delivered directly to your uh, smart device. You can also go to our website. There is an RSS feed there for any Android devices, so there's so many ways to get it and go back and rehearse it. We're in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. I'm going to pick up there again today because we've got so much uh, ground to to cover that I, I, it's, it's just almost overwhelming. But uh, I want to go again and just begin reading in verse number 1 of chapter 14. I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, with him 144,000, having their father's name written in their foreheads. I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. They sung as it were a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders, and no man can learn the song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defied with women, for they are virgins. This is what we dealt with last week. They are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God. And we're going to deal with the first fruits this week. A couple of things. We want to deal with the first fruits. They are the first fruits unto God. And to the lamb, and in their mouth was found no guile. So I want to talk about no guile. And they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of the waters. I probably won't get that far, so I probably need to stop reading there. I want to come back and talk about. Uh, first of all, they're the first fruits. Uh, the first fruits among men, uh, from, from the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 22, verse 29, I want to read this verse. It says, Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits, and of thy liquors, the firstborn of thy sons, shalt thou give unto me. Uh, the first fruits were considered to be holy. They were a wave of sheath that would guarantee that a harvest is coming. They would parade the, the, the feast of, first, of, of uh, first fruits when they would wave, they would walk down the streets of the city and they would wave a sheath of first fruit and they would wave it before God as a guarantee that a harvest is coming. So uh, the idea, let me, let me just read this from my notes. It said, thus the latter part of this chapter has with it the idea of the harvest paradigm. Jesus was the first fruits of them that slept, and we are a kind of first fruits. We are the tithe, watch this, of the earth. And I started thinking about this first fruit and this wave of sheath of first fruit. Uh, and uh, what I began to think about was the whole powerful idea of the tithe or the wave of sheath of first fruit. Because when they would wave this sheath, it would be like waving it before the Lord saying to, to, uh, to the people, a harvest is coming in. I could think even about Ephesians where it says when we received the Holy Spirit of promise, it was the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance. It was the first fruits, first of all, to us until the redemption of the purchased possession. But the paradigm I'm after is this. I got to thinking about this in light of, uh, you know, Malachi, the book of Malachi. I believe it is chapter 3. He says, if you will uh, bring the tithe into the storehouse. Now, I know that this is a touchy subject with a lot of grace guys, and I'm not going to get into the, uh, the fight of do we tithe, do we not tithe. Uh, uh, I do believe that uh, the principle of the new covenant is that we don't pay tithe. We don't owe anything, but we can give tithe. We can give offerings. Uh, whether you want to call it tithe or not, that's, that, uh, that, that's a fight for another day. What I'm simply after is this. In Malachi 3, he says, If you will bring the tithe into the storehouse, try me now and see if I won't open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there is not room enough to receive. And the thing that I want to grab from this, and while I do, let me just say this, for me personally, I am a covenant giver. 
I, I, I'm, uh, I believe that tithe is a covenant connector. I believe what we don't support goes away. So I do believe in supporting. And we don't have a problem uh, with a restaurant suggesting that we give 15 to 20 percent at a table. But somehow we get upset when somebody calls our giving a tithe. I think it's simply a guideline under the old covenant. We, we gave grudgingly. In the New Testament, we give cheerfully. We don't give grudgingly or of necessity, but God loves a cheerful giver. Now, let me just say this to you, because I do believe, first of all, that uh, giving is part of our relational uh, covenant connector with God. It doesn't buy us anything. I'm not giving to get blessed. I'm giving because I am blessed. Mel uh, Abraham did not tithe to uh, Melchizedek because he had to or to get the victory. He gave because he was on his way back from one. You cannot buy the blessing of God, but you can receive the blessing of God through the victory of a triumph. And you and I are not headed for victory. We are living in the victory of one that Jesus already won for us. So I give out of that. I don't want to get into the whole tithing paradigm as far as money, except to say that I, I'm a, I, I do believe in covenant giving. Now, let me say this to you. I want to say that the tithe in Malachi is bigger than just your money. Because if the tithe is the first fruits in the scripture, then uh, Jesus, I just, I just shared with you, Jesus is the first fruit. So if I could say it like this, Jesus is the tithe. Jesus completely fulfilled the tithe principle. Now let me say it to you like this. If Jesus is the tithe, if you will bring the tithe, what's that mean? Jesus. If you will bring Jesus, the tithe, into the storehouse. This is the temple of God. You bring the tithe into the storehouse. Now, let me tell you, if you've got a tithe living inside of you, you won't ever have a problem giving one because God so loved that he gave. You've got a giver living in you. But here's what I'm after is if the tithe is living in you and you brought the tithe, Jesus, the first fruit, into your storehouse, Hebrew or not Hebrews, Malachi 3 says, try me now and see if I won't open, not for you, but I will open you as a window of heaven and pour you out as a blessing that there is not room enough to contain. In other words, instead of looking for God to pour something on me, I'm looking for God to pour something out of me. Since the tithe lives inside of me, God says, I will open you the windows of heaven. I'm you're, see, you are either a gate of hell or you're a gate of heaven. And man, I could sidetrack and teach a whole message on Adam was the gate of hell. Jesus was the gate of heaven. And uh, he tells them in... Uh, uh, I believe it is Matthew 16. I don't know if I could find it real quickly here or, or not, but I just saw this just the other day. I believe it's Matthew 16. I believe it's in uh, the Message Bible uh, where he tells them, he's asking uh, Peter, who do men say that I am? And, and here it is. It says, and, um, uh, Jesus, uh, when Jesus arrived in the villages of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, what are people saying about who the Son of Man is? They replied, some think he is John the baptizer, some Elijah and um, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He pressed them, and how about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter said, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus came back and said, God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My father in heaven, God himself, let you in on this secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you really are. You are Peter, a rock, and this is the rock on which I will put my together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And that's not all. You will have complete free access to God's kingdom. Keys to open any and every door. No barriers between heaven and earth and earth and heaven. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. And he swore to the disciples to the secrecy that he made them promise they would tell no one that he was the Messiah. See, I believe that when he says, I will open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that you're either a gate of heaven or a gate of hell. And what I believe that this is based on is two things. A revelation the keys of the kingdom that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. Here's the keys of the kingdom, that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. It is a revelation, a God-given revelation of who Jesus Christ is as the Messiah in his death, burial, and resurrection. And it is a revelation of who Jesus tells you that you are. And I'm going to tell you what he wants to tell you you are here in Revelation 14 is that you are virgins. You follow the Lamb wherever he goes. You are a part of of a massive harvest. And he tells them in the book of Malachi, 
because you have brought the tithe into the storehouse, because Jesus lives in you and he is the tithe and he is the first fruit, I will open you up and I will pour you out a blessing that there's not room enough to receive and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake because of you, because you work there or because you live there. I'm going to rebuke the devourer in that area because of you. We carry something powerful. When I see this group on Mount Zion and they are... Uh, a part of this harvest. See, one of the things God is going to do, he said, I won't cause your, uh, your fruit to be cast before it's time. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. In other words, the harvest is going to come in because this group of people on Mount Zion are a first fruits unto God out of every nation, kindred, and tongue. If you will, they are a kind of tithe as well that are being used as being opened as windows of heaven with a revelation of who Jesus is, with keys of the kingdom that unlock the keys of the kingdom, but yes in heaven as a yes on earth, a no in uh, heaven is a no on earth. Now, I need to go on because the next thing it talks about is in their mouth was found no guile. Guile is the Greek word for the word lie. Now, let me uh, just read a few scriptures about the fact that they don't have any guile or any lie in their mouth. Romans 1, 23 says, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, uh, if you remember, the judgment that's coming in the book of Revelation is coming upon idolatry. It is coming upon those who have got, become, uh, if you will, a coalition and an agreement with the beast, the land beast, the sea beast, and all that that stuff has to do with. They are idolaters. But he's talking about uh, that what happens in Romans 1 is that the lie is they change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. They have entered into some form of idolatry, uh, if you will. They are worshiping, in this case, the beast and his image and his mark and all of that. They've come into agreement with that. But i got to tell you, these on Mount Zion don't have any guile or any lie in their mouth. They're declaring he's the king. He's the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 11 says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie and be damned. The contrast is that, the, that, that in the book of Revelation chapter 14, they have an everlasting gospel to preach while Babylon, while Babylon, the religious confusion, has a cup full of abominations and poisons. I don't know about you, but I'd rather drink from the cup of the everlasting gospel, because the everlasting gospel is what is in their mouth. And there is no lie in the gospel. It is not idolatry of human performance. It is not idolatry of worshiping the systems of the beast or the images that Rome demanded or emperor worshiper or self-worship or anything the like. There's no guile, no lie in their mouth. And, and uh, chapter 14, verse 6, that I saw the angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This is in fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 24 when he said, For this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness, and then the end will come. Uh, the end was the end of the age of the law, not the end of this dispensation or the end of this age. It was Jesus declaring the gospel will be preached in all the world. This company with him on Mount Zion are the faithful who faithfully declared the sword of of the word of God that's coming out of his mouth and the truth of the gospel. And it is in fulfillment of Matthew 24, which says the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. Then the end will come. You know, we got a lot of people that are talking about, well, we need to preach the gospel of the kingdom, which I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, the gospel of the kingdom is probably the least preached of anything. But nevertheless, if we are going to say that as being, it's got to be preached before the end comes, then the end has to somewhere still be out in our future. But let me show you in the book of Romans where this was fulfilled that Jesus said had to be preached in all the world. Romans 10 verse 17 says, 17, this is Romans 10, 
17 through 21. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But I say, have you not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. So the word of faith, he said, has, according to the apostle Paul, has been preached in all the world. But I, but I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah says, Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. This is exactly what's happening in Revelation 14, is the faithful are being brought in, and uh, those that have been apostate Jews are about to miss out on the covenants of prophets, uh, prophets or, or the covenants of promise. And God is about to give it to the Gentiles to provoke to jealousy in fulfillment of what He said in Romans 10 and what He also said to Isaiah the prophet all day long. I've stretched out my hands to this disobedient and gainsaying people. Colossians 1, verse 5 through 6, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world. So he's telling you again, the gospel has been preached in all the world so that an end could come. That end is not in our future. It occurred in 70 AD at this time when judgment is coming upon Babylon, which I will show you as we go on into this uh, teaching that Babylon was the apostate city of Jerusalem and it was the land of the people who had resisted the one who had held out his hand all day long to them to an obstinate and resistant and, uh, and a rebellious people, which is coming to as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also is in you since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. So the message of the grace of God in truth has been preached in all the world, and it should bring forth fruit. Now remember, we're about to harvest in chapter 14. The harvest is coming. There's a word that's flowing out of the mouth of this people uh, that is the gospel of the kingdom that must be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. And in this harvest is, again, two dimensions. We're going to see that there's two dimensions in this uh, harvest, and that is that there's a harvest of wheat being brought into the barn and the tares being burnt with an unquenchable fire, the grapes being brought into the wine and the rest of the drought of the wine grapes being trampled and the vintage of the grapes of wrath outside the city, and we will see that as we continue uh, to read this. But the gospel of the kingdom has been preached, and now the end was coming upon them. Verse 7 says, saying with a loud voice, this is Revelation 14, verse 7, Give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. That worsh And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornications. Now remember, the contrast here is they that are with him are virgins. They're not fornicators like Esau was. And I touched that in a prior segment. Esau was a fornicator. You say, what do you mean? I, didn't, I never saw where there was any sexual immorality in Esau. No, but the, the, the thing that I really share with you is that, that uh, Esau was a picture of fornication because fornication is m having intimate relationship with something outside of your covenant. And so the new covenant... Uh, uh, in other words, we're not going back to commit adultery. And I could, you know, go to Romans 7 and read that. That they that are married to the law and married to Jesus are adulterers. That's, that, that's spiritual adultery. That's spiritual fornication. That's spiritual harlotry. And that's what this city is being accused of. Uh, she, she has uh, made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark, and his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. 
And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and who receive the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments and the faith of Jesus. Now watch this, because this stuff here, when you put it in exactly the context with some other scriptures, will begin to explain itself. What he was saying is that the cup of wrath, they have filled up then the measure of their father's sin. In Matthew 23, Jesus prophesies, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, woe. Well, he prophesies, I think, six woes. And he says to them, fill up then the cup. They, the, the cup of wrath had been completely filled up, and now this cup is being poured out without mixture upon those who have rebelled and those who are the enemies of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment is about to ascend up forever. And we want to think about that in some distant future, but really that's not the context. He's talking about the burning and the destruction of Jerusalem and dismantling it, and it coming when it was literally burnt to the ground until it was pried the rocks apart, and it burnt and melted with a fervent heat. Look at the scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 10 says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians, and God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of, one, of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God, and your patience and your faith. Now remember, he tells them in Revelation 14, here is the faith and the patience of the saints. He that kills with the sword is going to be killed with the sword. So they've been martyred, they're being plundered, their goods are being sold. And he said to them, your patience and faith and your persecutions. He said, so that we are such glory in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you enter. The pressures that you are under from these Romans and from your own countrymen in religion. He guess, which is a manifest token. Let me calm down. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, su suffer, seeing that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now remember in Revelation 14, this is the exact wording he's doing. He's coming with uh, his angels and there are the sound of harpers harping and there's 144,000 on the mountain with him. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, look at this, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall punish with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. That is absolutely the fulfillment of what he's promising them in Revelation chapter 14 when he's telling them that there is a fire and brimstone that's coming that's going to come right in the presence of the Lamb and the holy angels. That that is in fulfillment the judgment that came in 70 AD when God came to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed. That's the fulfillment of that. I also want you to remember also that the same day Lot, that Lot left Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me just read this because I can get through some of it quicker. This is my notes. Remember also that the same day that Lot left Sodom and Gomorrah, it rained fire and brimstone. So shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Also in Matthew 13, the harvest is the end of the age, and the angels are the reapers, and the tares are to be burned with an unquenchable fire. Also in fulfillment of the last few verses of Hebrews chapter 12, where our God is a consuming fire, and where Peter also talks about the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, this is all the same fulfillment. Remember also that the followers of the beast do not have any rest day or night while it is proclaimed concerning the believers that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. This harvest paradigm is the next part of this vision because he comes and, and the 14th verse is one, again, tying the cloud coming of Jesus to this scene of judgment as we complete all of these pictures from the judgment upon the temple to the gospel being preached to every creature, the blessing over the dead. All of these connect perfectly to his cloud coming. And if you want to compare a place where his cloud coming, uh, Psalm 18 said, verse 7 through 5, Then the earth shook. 
and trembled. The foundation also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, the fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down. Darkness was under his feet. He rode upon the cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. As the brightness that was before him, his thick dark clouds passed. Hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomfited them. The channels of the waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered. As I rebuke, O Lord, the blast of thy nostrils, I saw in the night vision. Behold, one like a son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and brought him near before him. That's Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. This cloud coming is a coming in judgment. It is a fulfillment of this fire. This judgment is all in fulfillment of the prophetic word that is so in context of what I just read. Furthermore, if you read in the, in the writings of Josephus, it says, During the time when the temple was being destroyed and burnt with fire, there was visibly seen in the clouds, literally in the clouds, as it were the appearance of horses and chariots moving about in the clouds and the sound of the armies of heaven literally and physically being seen and recorded by Josephus and by Eusebius. And then a voice came from the most holy place saying, We are departing hence. God's judgment was coming upon apostate Israel in 70 AD in complete and perfect fulfillment of all that was prophesied. We're out of time. Take a moment to call that number on the screen. If you need prayer, you'd like to sow seed into the ministry, it is your faithful partnership and gifts that help us stay on the air and take this kind of a message around the world, the gospel of the kingdom being preached to every creature under heaven. We continue to do that as you help us to us. God bless you. For anyone struggling to understand John's writings in Revelation, this book provides true, biblically-based answers. Through detailed insights into the letters John wrote to the seven churches of his day, you will learn how to avoid the mistakes of the early church to overcome today's trials and tribulations. This book will provoke you to thought and dialogue, bringing greater clarity and revelation of Jesus Christ.